straight to quarters. Run out the gun. Stand by the starboard battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynn stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Presenting Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. seem absurd now that I should have dreaded to return to England. But in spite of my present years and honors, I'm under no illusions as to the fickle nature of the public. And neither was I then. Whatever had occurred since, there was no gainsaying the fact that I had lost my ship, the Sutherland, in battle, and that I should be called to account for it. If the court-martial should decide that I was at fault, disgrace or even death might await me. My thoughts were as somber as the gray dawn about me as I paced the deck of the Witch of Endor and the coast of France fell away over the horizon. Come to the hall, What is that? At the sound of the English voice, words failed me for a moment. At least there was no need now to hide in the mist. On the other hand, it brought nearer all the future which I was dreading. I say, what color is that? Well... I'd fly my colors to the last. If my career was to end, it would end with a joke. In Britannic Majesty's arm, Cutter Witch of Endor. Captain Horatio Hornblower. What ship is that? Oh, I am. Captain Sir Thomas Hardy. What did you say that Captain was? He must think we're mad, sir. The Witch of Endor has been a French prize for a year, uh, and you've been dead for six months. Oh! Very well, Mr. Bush. Ease her in under the stern of that two-decker and bring her to the wind under the lee. As the boat bore me to the triumph side and I stared at the familiar beauty of the ship of war again, the two yellow streaks along her sides, checkered with gun ports, the pennant at the main, the hands on her deck, the red coats of the marines. As I heard the distant voice of a boatswain roaring at the seamen, all the familiar sights and sounds of the Navy in which I had grown up. I was hard put to it to restrain my emotion. This was indeed the end of my long captivity in flight. Hardy was there on deck, his huge bulk towering over everybody. I saw his expression alter. Good God! It is Hornblower. Welcome back. Give me your hands up. Thank you, sir. How did you come here, sir? How did you take the witch? How on earth? Uh, how did I come back from the grave? <laughs> Is that what you want to ask? Well, well, it's a long story. Uh, you better come round to my cabin, Hornblower. This must be a pretty difficult time for you. Didn't you know Leighton was killed? No. 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 Don't worry about me. I, I, I've heard nothing for months. Yes, he died of his wounds at Gibraltar. Oh, uh, I see. Have you, have you heard anything of my wife? Well, I remember reading that she was awarded a civil list pension by the government when the news of your your death arrived. No other news, Hardy? 
There was a there was a child on the way. Oh, none that I know of. But then I've been four months on this ship. I wouldn't hear anything. Over the horizon to leeward was appearing a long line of ships close hauled. They were in rigid, regular line. And as we watched, they went about in succession, in perfect order, as if chained together. The Channel Fleet was a drill. Eighteen years of drill at sea had given them unquestioned superiority over any other fleet in the world. The victory is in the van. Here, take my glass. Signal, midshipman. Yes, sir. Signal triumph to flagship. Have on board Captain Horatio Hornblower. While Hardy dictated his message, I looked through the glass. A three-decker with her admiral's flag at the main was leading the long line of ships, the broad stripes on her side glistening in the sunlight. She'd been Jarvis's flagship at St. Vincent, Hood's in the Mediterranean, and Nelson's at Trafalgar. Now she was dismal Jimmy's. A tragedy, if ever there was one. Signal hoists were soaring up her yard arm. Hardy was busy dictating replies. Admiral signaling for you to go aboard. I trust you'll do me the honor of making use of my barge, Horatio. The Triumph's barge was painted primrose yellow, picked out with black. And so were her oar blades. Her crew wore primrose-colored jumpers with black neckcloths. As I took my seat, I reflected gloomily and that I'd never been able to afford to dress my barge's crew in a fancy rigor. Hardy must be a wealthy man, I suppose, with his Trafalgar prize money and his pension as Colonel of Marines. I could not help contrasting our positions. He, a baronet, wealthy, famous. Myself, poor and distinguished. And awaiting trial. Marines! Reserves! Welcome aboard, Captain Honda. I'm Callender, Captain of the Fleet. His lordship gave instructions for you to be shown to his cabin. Uh, will you come this way? Thank you. I don't suppose you remember me, but I was first lieutenant in the Amazon when you were in the Indefatigable. On the contrary, I remember you very well. In fact, uh, <laughs> there was a certain boat drill at Portsmouth. Huh? That... <laughs> oh, you remember that, do you? Very well. Well, I'd only been first for a week then, and I had to throw my weight about in somebody. Oh, here's his lordship's cabin. Uh, thank you. Uh, will you make yourself comfortable while I tell him you're here? Lord Gambier's cabin was not nearly so ornate as Hardy's had been. The most conspicuous item was the big brass-bound Bible on the table. I sat down on a cushioned locker and stared gloomily out of the stern window. The next hour might easily decide my whole fate. <coughs> I am the Admiral's clerk. Yes. Uh, his lordship will receive your report shortly. Uh, in the meantime... Well? well? What's such a hiding behind your back? I'm afraid, sir, that I have bad news for you. What news? Well, come along, man, out with it. The fellow had an odd expression on his face, and although I spoke up boldly enough, my heart sank. Was it possible that my case had already been prejudged? Was I to be arrested, tried... Condemned, shot. I remembered having seen this paragraph in the Morning Chronicle of three months ago, sir. I showed it to his lordship and Captain Callender as they decided it ought to be shown to you as early as possible. Well, his lordship says... Well, give me the paper. What is the paragraph? I'm afraid it's very bad news, what sir. What blast you? Let me see it. The Lord giveth, sir, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We regret to announce the death in childbed on the 7th of this month of Mrs. Maria Hornblower, widow of the late Captain Horatio Hornblower, Bonaparte's martyred victim. The tragedy occurred in Mrs. Hornblower's lodgings at Southsea, and we're given to understand that the child, a fine boy, is healthy. His lordship instructed me, sir, to inform you of his sympathy. He will not expect your report yet, and he thought you might wish to seek the consolation of religion in your cabin. Um, yes. The Lord give it, sir, and the Lord... Get out, dear. Go on, get out. <laughs> In 
the actual battle of Rosas, my lord, before I surrendered the Sutherland, 117 of my ship's company were killed and 145 wounded. 44 of the latter died before I was taken to Rosas. A tragically high proportion, Captain. Good God, more than half your crew out of action before you surrendered? If you remember, my lord, Thompson and Miliander lost 92 out of the 300 off Crete, and everyone said what a gallant defense he'd made. I was aware of it. Uh, please go on, Captain. Well, I told how I'd witnessed the destruction of the French squadron, how Caillard had uh, arrived to take me to Paris, and about escape. I made but slight mention of the Comte de Grasse and our voyage down the Loire, but I went into some detail about the capture of the Witch of Endor. As I pointed out, a knowledge of harbor arrangements at Nantes and the navigation difficulties of the lower Loire might be of great future value. Good God, man! How can you be so cold-blooded about it? Weren't you... Captain uh, Callender, I have requested you before not to allude to the deity in that blasphemous fashion. Any repetition will incur my serious displeasure. Now, let me see. That cutter will be useful. She can carry the dispatches, and I shall not have to weaken the main body of the fleet. This lieutenant of yours, Bush, I'll promote him into her as commander. I gave a gasp of pleasure. Promotion to commander meant almost certain post rank within the year. Bush deserved it, of course, but admirals usually had some favorite, some nephew or old friend's son awaiting the first vacancy. But that was by no means all. Promotion of my lieutenant to commander was a high compliment to me. It set the seal of official approval on my actions. This decision of Gambia's was a public announcement that I had acted correctly. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, my lord. Thank you. I hope you will continue to be my guest until I sail for Portsmouth next week. It would be best, I think. Yes, my lord. Thank you. But however delicate the illusion, I knew that the last remark was a reminder of my position and that I was technically under arrest. By old established custom, I must be under the supervision of an officer of equal rank while under arrest. There could be no question of being sent home in the Witch of Endor. Come in. Uh, Bush! Bush, by all that's wonderful. Come in, man. Sit down. Here, here, here. Here, let me take those parcels. Oh, by heaven, it's, it's good to see your honest old face again, Bush. Uh, look, um, have a drink. Uh, how have you been getting on? Uh, what have you been doing? Did you... Did you... Oh, easy, sir, easy. I'll tell you about it, sir. But of first of all, this is the first chance I've had to thank you for my promotion, sir. Oh, don't thank me. You must thank Lord Gambia. Uh, I know who I owe it to all the same. They're going to post me as captain this week. Ah. Uh -huh. They won't give me a ship, not with this wooden leg of mine, but uh, there's a job at Sheerness waiting for me. I'd never have been a captain but for you, sir. Oh, rubbish. Uh, well, how are you, boss? <laughs> how are you? Oh, fine, sir. Thanks. Good. And you? Oh, uh, uh, <clears throat> I was... Uh, I was sorry to hear about Mrs. Hornblower, sir. Yes. I, uh, I took the liberty of bringing out your letters. Oh, this thank you, big Bush. package is a sword, I'm sure, sir. Oh, well, let's open it and see. Well, by heavens. Oh, Bush, I... I never expected to see this again. I know that gold scabbard anywhere, sir. It's the hundred guineas sword that the Patriotic Fund gave you for your defeat of the Natividad yes. in the Pacific. Yes. Uh, you should see the newspapers. You're famous, sir. Uh, so you ought to be. And there's plenty more news. Oh, what news, Bush? There's the Witch of Endor, sir. Oh, yes, what about it? The Navy bought it yesterday at the prize court. All thousand pounds was the price, sir. I was greatly impressed by the tact with which Bush allowed me to assimilate all this. I would not have expected such delicacy from the tough old campaigner. But I was already beginning to realize that I still had much to learn about people. The first dozen letters were from people unknown to me, but all congratulatory. Two were from madmen, apparently, and two more from peers. And then I saw a letter in a hand which was known to me, and my heart constricted as I stared at the envelope. It was from Lady Barbara. Bush and the ship and Portsmouth and all the present world spun and vanished at the sight of the letter. I was not reading. I was listening again to that dear, modulated voice which I had not heard for so many, many weary months. It is hard for me to write this letter. So overwhelmed am I with pleasure and surprise at hearing that you are free and well. 
I hasten to let you know that I have your son here in my care. My son? Barbara has him. Oh, God bless her. When he was left orphaned, I ventured to take charge of him and make myself responsible for his upbringing. While my brothers, Lords Wellesley and Wellington, consented to act as his godfathers at his baptism. Whereat he was consequently given the names of Richard, Arthur, Horatio. Richard, Arthur, Horatio. And Wellesley and Wellington behind him. <laughs> well, the boy's fortune's already made. Richard is a fine, healthy boy with a wonderful resemblance to his father. And he has already greatly endeared himself to me. Let me assure you that I shall look upon it as a pleasure to continue to have charge of Richard until the time comes for you to take him away. I can easily guess that you will be much occupied with affairs on your arrival in England. But you will be very welcome should you care to call here to see your son, who grows in intelligence every day. Up to this moment, I'd hardly thought about the child. My paternal instincts had not been touched by a child I had never seen. And besides, they were warped by memories of the little Horatio who had died of smallpox in my arms so many years ago. But now, I felt a sudden wave of affection for the unknown little chap who had managed to endear himself to Barbara in London. Why had Barbara taken him? Was it because, widowed and childless... She had sought for a convenient orphan to adopt him. Was it that she still cherished memories of a Captain Hornblower, whom at the time she believed to be dead? Time stood still while I stared at the letter and wondered. Bush was saying something. I tore myself back to the present with an effort. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Oh, yes, but, um, they questioned me at Whitehall, and I thought you ought to know. What? They're calling me in evidence at the, uh, the court-martial, sir. The court-martial? For a few wonderful moments, I had forgotten that threat hanging over my life. The court-martial. If that were to go against me, not all the sons or lords and ladies in Christendom could help me. It was more than my life at stake. It was my reputation, my honor, my whole future. <laughs> Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.